for the uh, for the intro. Um, so yes, like I said, so I'm Prithvi, Raj, whatever you want to call me. Um, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about language learning in interactive environments, right? So let's jump straight into it, right? So people affect change in the world all the time using natural language. So a solid chunk of our communication is grounded in real world actions, right? So now think about using that kind of communication to help train agents that operate on language, right? So the question here really is, you know, what is required to get these automated agents to do the things that uh, we as people do so easily? Um, and the title of this slide is basically a spoiler. Um, it's, it's what I'm gonna talk about for most of the rest of this talk. Um, so I'm gonna actually first spend a little bit of time defining the two terms that you see on the screen here. So the first common denominator here is interactivity, right? So it's the, it's the first term I mentioned earlier. And now the sort of idea that we teach and we learn interactively, it's really quite ingrained, right? So um, what we do, you know, how we say or do things um, is refined in this sort of like trial and error process um, in a very tight feedback loops, right? Um, so honestly, like at this point, even within our pop culture, you know, uh, one of the ways that we can tell whether an AI has, you know, sort of human level intelligence um, is, you know, how it displays its communication skills, right? So if it's able to interact and learn and teach uh, in the sort of like back and forth manner with others. Um, so this seems to be a, a key component of language competence. So now onto the, the second of the terms I showed earlier, right? Situated. Um, so at its core, situated, all this really means is the things that we do or say depend on the current context around us um, and they draw from our shared experiences, right? So this is really intent grounded in shared thought. So this can be anything from a, a group of people role-playing characters in an adventure game, you know, something like Dungeons and Dragons, um, having this sort of like common fantasy world that they all imagine themselves being in, um, and yet at the same time extrapolating real life experiences, you know, things like camping in the woods, whatever, um, to fantasy settings. Um, and it could also be something like entirely mundane, right? So as the fact that, you know, all of us have this sort of shared agreement that, you know, hey, look, spoons are useful because they let us eat ice cream, right? So this is the idea behind common sense. Um, so now what's the first AI technique that comes to mind when we say interactive and environmentally grounded, right? Reinforcement learning. I'm gonna pretend all of you got the answer, right? And I'm gonna show you um, a diagram that I basically at this point, like everyone sees in their like undergrad intro to AI class. Um, but I like this diagram anyway, right? Like it helps make my point. So this is the, the sort of standard reinforcement learning setup, right? So in this, in this setup, you know, an agent performs an action um, every step with the intent of achieving a goal. Um, the action affects the surrounding environment. So in this case, it's basically the world. Um, and then the agent observes how the world changes while also getting a reward that tells it if it's made progress towards its goal, right? So it's basically um, learning by interacting in a situated fashion, right? So that's with this environment. Um, so this seems to check all the boxes for, you know, the, the key components that we talked about before. Um, so why have people not put two and two together? And, you know, why do we not see like a bunch of like reinforcement learning agents um, uh, operating on language? Okay, so to understand that, let's actually first take a look at an example of an agent that operates on language in action, right? So these are kind of everywhere now, right? Yeah, you know, it's basically, you know, pick your favorite corporate copyright brand, you know, whatever, really. Um, so all of these things operate on language, um, but the problem here is that the environment is people, um, right? So in order for these things to learn interactively, they need to interact with humans to learn. And that's really quite costly. Um, so prohibitively so, in fact. Um, and as a consequence, situated language learning is not something that's been you know, particularly well studied, right? Um, so now the question shifts to, hey, look, does there exist a platform um, on which we can sort of more easily simulate communication grounded in real world actions? Um, obviously the answer is yes, this would be a really short talk if the answer was no. Um, so this is uh, me introducing you to the answer. So this is interactive narratives or text games. 
Um, and so text games are sort of uh, these like games in which you have to complete long puzzles or quests. Um, with the key difference from like normal games being that everything that you do, uh, like uh, the way you interact with the world is through textual natural language. So what you're looking at is Zork. So one of the uh, earliest, most popular text games. So when you first enter the world of Zork, um, you know, you receive a description of what the world looks like around you, right? So this is uh, the game telling you, hey, you're standing in an open field west of a White House. Um, there's a mailbox there. Given that, you can sort of type in what you want to do. So open the mailbox. You know, the game tells you, okay, so what's what happens once you've actually opened the mailbox? So opening the mailbox is revealed the leaflet, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so now these games have existed for a really long time, like probably like double my, my lifespan so far. So they've been around since like the mid seventies or something way before like graphics were a thing. Um, so this is like a very mature community and game devs are really quite creative, right? So you put two and two together, what you get are these like ridiculously large complex worlds um, that, you know, have like puzzles, like quests to solve. Um, this is actually the map of Zork. So the little bit that you saw on the screen earlier is actually just like one room um, in this entire map that you have to sort of like traverse and solve um, through. Actually it doesn't stop there, right? So interactive narrative is sort of like a very broad term. Um, and what I showed you was only like text games, right? So um, at some point last year when we were like organizing a NERVS workshop on this, we were curious um, and, you know, using the, the power of the Microsoft Research Twitter account, we, we decided to ask people, yeah, so what comes to your like mind when you think of like interactive narrative, right? Um, and it turns out that like uh, the number of people that think of like text games like Zork as the first thing is actually like fairly small. So we sort of like Twitter crowdsourced, um, you know, like different types of interactive narratives and you know, there's, like a ridiculous number of things, right? So everything from like choose your own adventure novels from like back in the fifties, all the way to like cyberpunk 2077, right? So like uh, an incredible number of genres like slice of life, walking simulators to Lovecraftian horror, you know, everything in between. Um, so long story short, you know, there's a lot of people already spending a lot of time developing environments in this space. And we really don't need to like reinvent the wheel. Um, we can sort of just like utilize these for training like agents that we want. So that's actually what I'm gonna be spending most of the rest of my talk on. So I'm gonna be focusing on two separate aspects um, of uh, interactive narratives. Um, the first bit is um, how do you get agents to operate? So like act and speak within these worlds. Um, and second, how do you just straight up like automatically create um, these worlds or like uh, structured uh, language generation? So onto the, the first of these. Um, so what are the challenges involved in getting agents to operate in these worlds? So there's sort of three core challenges. Um, and I'm gonna go a little bit in depth into each of these challenges now. So the first challenge is partial observability, right? So this is really the question of, you know, how can the agent, um, you know, represent the state of the game world? So, you know, like you guys saw earlier, um, agents really only interact with the world through textual natural language. So they only really see uh, very small bits of the world around them through potentially like incomplete descriptions, right? Um, and now these games have, you know, tens to hundreds of locations with like unique characters, objects, descriptions, whatever, right? So, you know, how are people like, you know, how is the agent actually supposed to like keep track of all of this? So this is like almost like a, like a textual slam problem um, to use the, the robotic parlance um, is, you know, you're trying to learn a map of the world while you're exploring it. And, you know, second, um, right? So like I said, you know, these kinds of games really need both like actions and dialogue to complete. Um, and, you know, so everything is in natural language um, and that means your action spaces are kind of ridiculously huge, right? So even with like a very tiny vocabulary, um, so if, say like Zork has this vocabulary of 700 and you're trying to just generate four word actions um, at every step, that still means you have 240 billion possible actions at every step, right? Um, and quite frankly, like, you know, current reinforcement learning algorithms are not designed to handle this kind of action space. Um, so they either do continuous or very small discrete spaces. So this is sort of the question, you know, how do you handle um, like ridiculously large or in the case of like dialogue, like effectively infinite 
um, sized action spaces. So the final uh, bit of this is, you know, common sense reasoning, right? Um, so now these interactive narrative games, they sort of make a lot of assumptions about the players, right? So, you know, things like common sense and genre knowledge is assumed before, you know, people even like come in and play the game, right? Um, so this is really the question of, you know, hey, how is the agent supposed to figure out, you know, what to do with the items that it has, you know, how to talk to the people around it, right? Um, how to sort of like interact with the common things in the world. So say as like an example, you or I come across a mailbox in a book. Now we know a sort of a reasonable way to interact with the mailbox is to try to open it, right? Um, but how do we give an agent the sort of like prior? So how do we like, you know, get the agent to know that it's smarter to open a mailbox instead of trying to eat the mailbox? Um, and similar sort of things when you're, you know, you're, you're talking to, to characters in the world. So like in a fantasy setting, you know, one doesn't normally like address a king as my dude, you know, unless you're trying to get executed, right? So it's basically the question, you know, how do we give agents all these priors? Okay, so I threw a lot of problems at you guys. Um, and now I'm going to throw a solution, right? So this is basically um, my silver bullet. And you're going to see this come up uh, effectively for the rest of this talk. Um, so the secret sauce for all of this is knowledge graphs. Um, so knowledge graphs are this sort of like very intuitive way of representing the world of a text game, right? So they're easy to understand, you know, they give us these sort of structured memory aids um, that help with the partial observability bits that I just talked about. Um, you know, they're able to contain information about, you know, what to do when, you know, helping with the sort of common sense reasoning, large action spaces. Um, and moreover, you know, people have already been using graphs as like game guides for quite some time now. So like what you're actually looking at on the screen here is a hand-drawn map of the world of Zork, you know, that somebody basically um, sat down so that they could actually keep track and solve this like ridiculously huge game, um, right? So on top of sort of being able to help with all of these challenges, you know, these things are also like interpretable to boot. So what do graphs um, in these text games actually look like? Right. So they look a little bit like this. So formally defined, you know, they're a set of triples of subject relation objects um, that are built as an agent explores the world. Right. So the agent receives this sort of like textual description that you see. Um, and, you know, using some kind of uh, information extraction method, you know, we're able to, to lift the graph um, from this text. So there's a couple ways of being able to, to sort of like lift the graph from the text. You know, the first is um, the, the sort of like obvious like rules-based approach, right? So just use like an off-the-shelf information extraction tool, um, you know, have some hand-authored tools uh, and, you know, voila, you have something that works, right? Uh, so it does work. It works decently enough, at least like it worked well enough for me to get like a couple papers out of it. Um, but, you know, um, you know, as I started uh, trying to throw this at like more and more games, um, you know, what I found was, um, this doesn't actually generalize particularly well, right? So this is like, I guess, like a, a caveat of anything rule-based. Um, and it starts to break down when you like start throwing like sort of novel domains at it. Um, and so at that point, you know, I came up with this other way um, of doing graph construction. And this is sort of a, a framing graph construction as a question answering problem. Um, so wherein an agent is intrinsically motivated to ask questions about the world um, and to learn information about it. Right. Um, so we're going to see in a little bit, you know, the hey, like, so this actually like, you know, generalizes better and provides like, um, you know, better sample efficiency. Um, so, of course, to, to train this, you know, I had to, I had to collect a data set, you know, something like 200,000 question answering pairs from 30 something games. Um, and then using that, I designed the Qbert agent. Right. Um, so this is the Qbert agent. And, you know, the, the sort of general gist of the idea is the agent builds a graph of the world. Um, by asking questions as it moves along. Um, so there's a bunch of moving parts here. I'm going to sort of go in depth-ish um, into some of these parts, right? So the first bit of this is, you know, the agent receives the, the, the description of the world and this description immediately goes to a question answering module. Now this question answering module is sort of responsible for taking in like an input question, this um, observation as context and sort of like highlighting the span within the context um, that best answers this question, right? So here we're really asking, the, the agent is asking questions, you know, things like, um, hey, where am I? Um, what do I see around me? Um, what are the things that I have in my inventory? You know, um, you know, what are the attributes of things? So on and so forth, right? 
Um, so with this, you know, this, this uh, question answering module basically like, you know, spits out a set of vertices and the sort of corresponding relations um, based on the questions. Um, and then you can sort of take the, the graph that you had at your previous step and uh, the sort of like uh, new updates from the current observation, smash them together um, in an update and you get like a graph that looks something like this, right? So um, this graph has, you know, information on uh, locations, the sort of like objects that you see around you, uh, the things you have in your inventory, what you're carrying at the current like time um, and attributes, right? So in this particular case, um, you see, hey, um, you know, you're in this location that's behind the house. Um, you know, the house has a window and, you know, you sort of generally know that an attribute of a window is that windows are openable, right? So sort of like long term, hopefully this is like able to help the bias the agent towards uh, trying to interact with the window by opening it. Um, and so the rest of this is sort of like about basically, you know, crunching the, the graph and the text observations down into sort of n-dimensional vectors um, and then passing them into like an actor and a critic. So like that basically um, take the, uh, these n-dimensional vectors and produce a action and a value respectively um, for what the agent does. Um, so sort of state dependent action. Um, so you rinse and repeat this many times. The rest of the training is done using A2C. So it's the advantage actor critic. Um, this is a fairly well-known reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, a bit with like a good chunk of like uh, modifications to loss functions and things like that. Um, I'm mostly going to gloss over the details of this. So you guys can, you know, go through the, the paper for this or talk to me offline um, about, you know, how the actual training for this is done. Uh, what I am going to do is I'm going to skip straight to the evaluation, right? Um, so what you guys are looking at on the screen is, you know, how like quickly um, these different agents um, gain reward. Um, so how quickly they're able to progress within these games, um, you know, as a function of, you know, uh, the reward, right? Um, so the two things that you see, so the green line is Qbert, so which is using the question answering. Um, and the, the other one is KGA2C. So that's basically uh, the predecessor, which used a rules-based approach. Um, so you can sort of see that long story short, adding in the sort of graph learning mechanism. So QA um, as graph learning um, sort of helps uh, significantly like improve sample efficiency um, for these agents. So not only that, you know, with some sort of like uh, additional exploration strategies on these. Um, so it turns out um, these agents basically get state of the art, not on Zork, not just on Zork, but like a bunch of other um, text games as well. Um, so they go sort of further in these games than ever before explored by like any learning agent. Um, so with that, so uh, this is sort of the, the first uh, mini section of the talk. Um, so let's look at sort of like what the, what the takeaways are here, right? Um, so in terms of the three challenges that I introduced to you guys before, um, so uh, in terms of partial observability, so knowledge graphs, let us overcome that by providing the agent with structured memory. Um, they help with uh, common sense reasoning. They're able to give the agent a sense of like affordances uh, for things that you can do with items um, and characters. Um, and finally, you know, having agents that are sort of these like intrinsically motivated to learn this knowledge graph lets us more effectively explore um, a combinatorially sized um, state action space. Okay, so this is the bit where, you know, if we were actually like in person, I would check if y'all are actually paying attention so you can, you know, you sort of like figure out what the whole is and what I've been telling you so far. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause for like three seconds and I'm just going to give you the answer. Right, so Zork is nice, but it's really mostly action oriented um, in that you really like really need only actions to get from end to end. Now I did say that operating in these worlds requires acting and speaking, right? So the question is, hey, so where are the speaky bits? Um, they're here, right? So remember how I said, um, you know, there's a bunch of different flavors of interactive narratives out there. Um, so all we really need to do is we need to find a flavor of interactive narrative um, where the speaky bits are sort of like core um, to this whole thing, right? Um, so this is light. 
Um, so Lay is this large scale crowdsourced text game, you know, the, um, the guys over at Facebook AI built, um, and it looks a little bit like this. So a, there's gonna be a lot of similarities that you see to Zork um, in that, you know, you have textual descriptions of the world around you. Um, you know, you can type in what you wanna do um, and, you know, you receive like updated descriptions of the world. Um, but what's new here is that like a core part of the gameplay for this um, is that you're required to have conversations um, with the characters that you see around you. So you can know sort of have conversations with uh, like the other characters that you see in the world around you in this like chit chat fashion, right? So this is just like a very casual conversation between an undead warrior and a serving boy, um, you know, in front of the main castle doors, right? I don't know what castle this is, but it's some castle. Um, so like, okay, so I said crowdsourced, right? So I said nothing about people, right? So people seem to be rather important um, for things like dialogue. Um, and so, you know, so where are the people, right? Uh, so, you know, like all of us are all the, all the time now, uh, people are on the internet. Um, and so, you know, what we needed to do was we basically needed to see how people acted and talked in character. Um, in these sorts of situations. Um, so what we did was, you know, we went back to the people on the internet, we had them play these quests in the sort of uh, simplified two player version of the light game on Messenger. Um, and it, it turns out like without too much effort on our part, we actually ended up getting something like 15,000 players within the first month um, of doing this without, we actually didn't even really have to like advertise that much. It kind of just like spread from people to people. Um, and so because of that, you know, we got a bunch of really good like human demonstrations um, with sort of minimal effort on our part. Um, and so these were human demonstrations of peak, uh, people sort of uh, speaking and acting in character um, in this sort of goal driven manner while trying to achieve their motivation. So they had like a character that they were role playing, the characters had, um, you know, motivations or quests that they were trying to do within the world um, and, you know, uh, people played the game like that. Okay, so let's recap a little bit here, right? So what do we have at this point? So what we have is we have a game. Um, we have actions to do in the game. Um, we have demonstrations of humans talking in character while playing it, right? Um, and so, you know, if you thought that, you know, just sort of uh, acting in these worlds is hard, you know, we've notched up the difficulty a bit, quite a bit by adding dialogue to the mix. Um, so there's this sort of like whole new search space to explore. And this is the question of, you know, how do you actually like balance between all these things? So fear not, um, this is not an entirely hopeless task. Um, it turns out we've actually done a good chunk of the legwork for this already. So everything that you see sort of circled on the screen here is um, things I've basically covered already in Qbert, right? Um, so the encoder, the different sort of like um, action policies, whatever. Um, and like what's sort of new uh, as a challenge in this space is um, now that you have sort of two action spaces, right? So you have this sort of dichotomy between acting in the world and also speaking to people in the world. Um, we need to figure out how those things like, you know, mesh with each other. Um, and you need to figure out, you know, how, do the, uh, how does the agent do this as it's interacting with multiple other characters and like agents in the world. And so this is sort of my solution for this, right? So this is the switch. Um, and so the switch, you can think of this as like a meta policy. So it basically makes the decision on at every step, should the agent act or should it talk? Um, and then it sends the state to the sort of like corresponding uh, policy network. Um, so, you know, there's, there's sort of a couple of sorts of switches that we tried out at least like um, initially. Um, the first is obviously the, the sort of like obvious hard coded approach, which just means, um, hey, I'm going to spend most of my life acting, but every, you know, two, three steps, um, I'm going to try to say something to, to one of the other characters, right? Um, and the second bit is, you know, obviously based on the training data, um, which means we look at the human demonstrations. Um, and we try to better sort of like mimic how people act versus talk while they're doing um, that sort of like particular quest. So once you like, you know, at this point, you know, the switch has made its decision on whether you the uh, RL agent should act or talk. Um, so, you know, you've outputted some sort of like thing to do 
um, for that particular step. And so once you do this, um, you know, you have uh, partner agents, other characters in the world that sort of also act or talk. Um, and then an environment processes all of this information. So it does this in two steps. So the actions are sent to a game engine, um, which then executes it and sees if the original quest goal has been achieved, right? So this is just checking for goal state completion. So say your initial goal is that you want to acquire a sword, um, right? So this is really checking, hey, do you have a sword within your inventory or not? So that's it sort of for the action-y bits. Um, so, but like what happens when you talk, right? Um, so when you talk, there's a couple of things. Um, so the utterance that you say um, goes to a DM. So that's a, that's a dungeon master for, you know, y'all non tabletop RPG people um, who rates how sort of natural or contextually relevant the thing that you've said is. Um, so for our purposes, the DM is sort of just a ranker model that's trained on human expert demonstrations. Um, so this DM sort of like um, the signal goes back into the agent's training loop as reward for it. So these sort of speech goals um, uh, for the agent are sort of also indirectly linked to the goal state um, in that, you know, you, it turns out, hey, you can actually also say something to convince your partner to achieve your goal for you. Right. Um, so say, for example, if your overall goal um, in this world, like before, was to get a sword, you know, you can either, you know, pick up the sword yourself, um, you know, steal it uh, or whatever, or um, you can try to get it by convincing one of the other characters in the world to give you a sword there. So there's a sort of like a negotiating aspect to things. So before we go any further, you know, let's actually take a look at like, you know, what this uh, sort of looks like in action, right? Um, so what you're looking at is sort of like fully uh, trained like RL agent on the right, you know, talking with, uh, with people um, in this sort of like back and forth manner. Um, so in this case, you know, the, the RL agent is a mermaid hunter. It's got this persona um, and it's talking to a fish seller at a fishing store. Um, right, so the mermaid hunters got this like uh, motivation that they want to hit the fish seller to remind them of who they are, you know, show them who's boss or whatever. Um, and so, you know, the, the conversation sort of goes back and forth, um, you know, the, the agents is doing like actions to um, move around, um, you know, uh, interact with the fish seller, say things to it, um, you know, until it finally, you know, achieves its motivation itself by, by hitting the fish seller. So this is sort of like a transcript of an agent, um, you know, achieving its motivation. And now sort of the, the flip side of it, this is a, an example of a partner completion, right? So when you convince your partner to, to sort of achieve your goal for you. Um, and so in this case, you know, you're, you're the king's advisor, um, you know, you're talking to uh, an old wizard in the king's throne room. And, you know, your motivation is you're trying to bring the king's pet back to him. Right. So once again, you know, you sort of see the, the conversation go back and forth um, until, you know, you, the RL agent, have sort of figured out, you know, exactly the right sort of sequence of um, dialogues that's required to convince um, the, the wizard in this case to achieve your goal for you. Um, so in this case, the, the wizard basically just gives you um, the, the king's pet, you know, in this case, like that's a that's a large line or whatever. Right. Um, go figure. Um, so to, to sort of better understand this acting and speaking dichotomy, um, what we did was we ran a bunch of ablations where we sort of tested, um, giving the agent different kinds of abilities and switches, right? So, you know, um, what if the agent could only act while it's operating in these worlds? What if it could only speak? What if it could both like act and speak? Um, right? So these sorts of like questions. Um, and, you know, what, what you're looking at here is basically zero shot performance of the agent, um, you know, a bunch of like held out quests, right? So the sort of general gist of the results here is that, you know, um, acting only without any sort of speech is most efficient if you want to just get things done. Um, but, you know, adding in speech doesn't actually really mess things up that much because it gives you a bunch of new ways of, you know, achieving your motivations um, and finishing quests, you know, via the other characters. Um, so sort of as a sanity check, you know, you're seeing these, these numbers. So zero to one um, is the scale of the goal completion. And for some sort of like reference, um, human goal completion, you know, when we deployed this on Messenger um, was about 60%. So about 60% of the time people were able to, to actually finish the quest that we gave them. 
you know, so not only that, you know, learning uh, when we should like act and when we should speak. So basically learning the switch, you know, improve sample efficiency and zero shot generalization, you know, you know, most likely because the agent is now sort of able to, to more evenly explore both the, the acting um, and speaking search spaces. Um, so I'm actually gonna skip through this, this sort of like next set of results um, in the interest of time. So, but the, the sort of high level overview is um, we tried a bunch of different ways of uh, pre-training the encoders um, using like no large scale knowledge bases and whatever. Um, and it turns out, you know, we, we ran the same sort of like um, ablations um, and it turns out that, hey, you know, in that case uh, in supervised settings, this is sort of comparing supervised versus reinforcement learning settings for, for doing dialogue here. Um, so in supervised settings, you kind of just keep adding more things to pre-training, uh, you know, more data sets, whatever, and it kind of just works, right? Like you throw more data at it and, you know, transformers eat that up and it works. Um, so you don't really need to like, you know, think too hard about it. Um, but it turns out like the same set of results don't really hold in the reinforcement learning setting. Um, you actually have to think really hard about what kinds of pre-training you do. Um, but if you do do a good job of it, then you sort of like significantly improve um, performance over any sort of like supervised. So like um, in this case, like if you actually get the pre-training right for reinforcement learning, like the, the performance on it is sort of like double that of any sort of, uh, you know, supervised approach. Um, and not just like, you know, doubling the performance and sort of zero shot uh, generalization, wise, but like, you know, uh, it also gets to that goal faster. So it's more sample efficient too. So the sort of main takeaways here are, hey, so, you know, it's possible to balance an agent between doing actions and dialogue. Um, you know, this is done sort of through the switch. Um, all these like big language model results that you see, you know, there's like, oh God, like three new papers, every like archive mailing list. Um, so they're cool, but they don't actually hold in the reinforcement learning setting like 90% of the time. Right, so this sort of like BERT image net movement for RL is not arrived, um, and you really need knowledge graphs to help with like a bunch of the challenges that I talked about so far. And sort of finally, you know, uh, in terms of zero shot uh, performance, um, we're able to create agents that are like you know not just consistent with terms of the actions that they're doing, um, but they're also natural in terms of the things that they say, um, you know, while they're trying to achieve their motivations. Okay, so. Tiny breather. So I'm going to sort of very, uh, fairly quickly, you know, skate through um, the, the second half of this talk. And it's actually not a half. It's more like a fourth at this point. Um, so, you know, I spent a good bit of time talking about, you know, operating in these worlds, right? So um, I want to take a second to, to jump the fence and think a bit about, um, hey, what does it take to actually just straight up create these worlds automatically, right? Um, so you can think of this as a form of creative structured language generation, um, wherein the creator is sort of, uh, needs to be able to plan and anticipate, you know, how other people will interact with the things created, right? So this is like, um, this is actually not unlike the problems faced by authors when, you know, writing novels or whatever, for example. Um, and, you know, so there's sort of the, like, uh, two similar challenges, like I talked about earlier. Um, so it's quite similar uh, to, the, to the thing. So, you know, you, you need common sense to do these kinds of things. Um, so you need to be able to, to create worlds that are, like, causally common, uh, coherent in terms of common sense norms, right? So, you know, pots are found on stoves, kitchens are inside houses. Um, you know, some of these common sense norms might change based on genre, right? So, you know, like in fantasy settings, animals talk. Um, you generally, like, you know, in real life, animals don't talk, probably, I don't know. Um, and, you know, so not just that, you know, quests have to conform to this sort of like um, world that they're in, right? So this is the second aspect of causal coherence. Um, and so I'm gonna jump into, you know, how do you sort of like, you know, make worlds, right? Make textual worlds out of this. Um, and the sort of very, very, very high level uh, gist of this approach is that we're gonna bring stories alive, um, which is sort of, you know, turning reading, linear reading experiences, right? So something like Sherlock or Rapunzel um, into explorable interactive worlds, right? So um, I'm gonna gloss over the details, but this is, you can think of this as sort of like reverse Qbert from earlier, right? Um, so in that case, the agent was building a graph of the world while asking questions. 
Um, in this case, what we're doing is we're asking questions about a story and extracting a world from the story. Um, so, you know, like what you see on the screen is what this ends up looking like, right? So you feed in like a short story of Sherlock, um, you get a world that looks like this, and then, you, you know, you're able to generate descriptions of the rest of it. Um, and, you know, this is what an example of the world looks like once this whole like system has been run end to end. So you now have like an explorable version of Sherlock where you're able to go to uh, 221 Baker Street, you know, examine like all the the characters on the world and the different like bank walls, see the char like characters, whatnot. So, you know, that was cool, right? So we have a world, but there's actually not really much to do in the world, um, you know, except sort of just run around and explore. Um, and that's not really fun. So what the people really want are quests or things to do in the world. Um, and so I'm gonna talk to you now about giving the people what they want, right? So we're gonna give the people um, quests. Um, so sort of keeping in line with this, uh, you know, bringing stories alive theme, um, we're going to do quests by first extracting high level plot lines from actual stories um, and then adapting them to sort of like fit low level game action scenarios by generating plot graphs. Um, and so I'm going to show you how to generate stories or quests, you know, using these uh, causal common sense plot orderings, right? So the idea here is that, you know, plot graphs are sort of structures that have been well accepted as representations of story progression. Um, but usually they rely on a lot of like hand engineered knowledge um, in order to retain uh, coherency and consistency. Um, and the main idea here is, hey, you know, so what if we could generate plots for stories by handing this task off to a neural common sense reasoning model, you know, not unlike a bunch of the stuff I've already been talking about. Um, so, you know, you can sort of get the best of both worlds, right? So plot generation sort of takes uh, three steps, right? So you have a starting plot point that you've extracted from the main story. You have an ending plot point. Um, and you have a bunch of intermediate links that sort of like um, go between the starting and the ending plot point. So the way we're gonna generate these like intermediate links is we're gonna do them using this transformer model, which is called Comet, right? Um, so uh, long story short, Comet is basically just a, a transformer um, that's trained on a large scale common sense knowledge graph called Atomic. Um, and so, you know, all Atomic really is, is it's got information like this, right? So it's like, you know, a person acts quickly because they want to run away, um, you know, or they're acting quickly because they need to like react fast, right? So it's got information about um, the wants and needs from the perspective of like a particular character. And so we're going to take, use this, right? Um, and using this, um, we're going to generate um, links that are going forward um, from the first plot point um, in the sort of like idea of uh, in terms of the, the character's wants, right? Um, so first, uh, you know, you see the first plot point is the, the husband fears for her life, you know, presumably talking about his wife. Um, so what's like a reasonable plot point to, to go to um, next? So, you know, the, the husband would want to get away, they'd want to be safe. Um, and, you know, Similarly, you know, you can keep going, right? They want to escape, be free, not hurt, whatever. Um, and so you have this sort of like forward set of like, you know, uh, plot graph that's based on, you know, what the character would want to do, um, like as next steps. And then you can sort of do the same thing backwards um, based on the character's needs this time, right? So you can think of this as, hey, so the final plot point is, you know, um, the, the, you know, he scales a wall, right? So what are the things that he actually needs to do um, in order to scale the wall? You know, so, you know, you actually need to be at the wall, you need to be at the location, um, you need to have knowledge of how to scale the wall. Um, you know, you, before that, you need to like walk to it, you need to have knowledge of how to climb, uh, so on and so forth. So you now have these sort of like forward and backward um, trees of uh, the different uh, things that the, the character can do. And, you know, the final step is sort of, you know, you're just like mixing these two things together, right? Um, so I'm going to sort of gloss over uh, the details of how to do this, but um, it's mostly like a, a dynamic programming style approach where you're linking um, the sort of best vertex in each of these subgraphs to the other um, based on uh, like log probabilities outputted by Comet. Um, 
So, you know, what is the sort of best node in the forward subtree to link to the, to the backward subtree? So I'm going to skip to, to evaluation. So obviously this is a lot harder to automatically evaluate. So we actually had to basically do human evaluations for this. Um, and so we were asking questions of people in sort of like three main areas, right? Um, so the first is coherence, you know, which of the, the games that you sort of like, or stories that you read um, was more coherent, you know, which uh, quests events had a more plausible ordering. Um, and then interestingness, you know, this is a game after all, right? So which was more interesting, which was more enjoyable, you know, basically, you know, kept your attention the longest. Um, and then genre resemblance. So we told people, hey, so this is going to be a, a fairy tale, uh, or this is going to be like a mystery and be like, um, so how much were we actually like able to match the given genre? So there's a lot of uh, bar things here. Um, so I'm gonna basically like skip through most of these, um, but what you really like need, uh, need to see is this is sort of like human pairwise preference across all of these metrics um, versus like a bunch of baselines, right? So the, the blue sort of indicates a preference for um, the, the model that we developed, um, the C2PO thing um, versus, you know, one of the baselines, right? Um, and so in basically like all these categories and like a bunch of different genres, um, you know, uh, we see that people have like, you know, over half the, the percentage of the population um, that we tested on, you know, preferred our model. So the sort of like main takeaways here um, is that you know, using the sort of like, you know, common sense reasoning to exploit quest structures um, in the form of plot graphs basically gives you more coherent, interesting, and thematically relevant quests. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the, the same theme as like some of the things we see earlier, right? Um, so the further that we get from, uh, the further the thematic common sense diverges from everyday common sense, um, so, you know, something like uh, fairy tales um, being uh, introducing a lot more fantastical elements than something more mundane, um, like a mystery genre. Um, the less weight that people actually place on causal coherence when looking at sort of like overall quality of generated text. Um, so basically, you know, um, in, in a genre like fantasy or fairy tales or whatever, we're allowed to cut more corners. Um, this generation system is allowed to make more mistakes than it is in something that, you know, something like mystery. All right, so final bit, right? So summary. So what have we actually learned? If there's like two things that you guys remember from this entire talk, it should be this, right? Um, so what is the platform that we should be using um, to, to sort of get interactive and environmentally grounded, like, you know, language agents? Um, so that's interactive narratives. Um, and two is, you know, how do you actually get these things to work, you know, with any like reasonable amount of uh, like accuracy? Um, and the answer to that is knowledge graphs and reinforcement learning. So this is sort of the, the sort of like a three second version of this entire talk. And that's all. Thank you.